Now that we are well into fall and winter is quickly approaching, the days are getting shorter and running in daylight is becoming harder. Wazelle's premium reflective collection is designed with runner safety in mind. Both highly visible in the dark but subtle in the daytime, thanks to the tonal reflective print that only shines bright when reflecting the light. From tight shorts, jackets, and tanks to accessories like hats and gloves, with Wazelle's reflective collection, you can stay safe and stay seen. It is dark here in Cleveland where I've been running, so I just love Wazelle's reflective collection. I'm a big fan of the firecracker tights. The bird pattern is so cute, and they look all over sparkly at night. To check out the firecracker tights and the rest of the reflective collection, go to wazelle.com slash collection slash reflective, or even easier, click the banner link at the top of the Hear Her Sports website at hearhersports.com. You are listening to Hear Her Sports, a podcast for active, adventurous women who love hearing stories from other active, adventurous women. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in sport through a conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. This week, I am fortunate enough to have with me sports nutritionist Nancy Clark. Nancy is a total rock star in sports nutrition, and talking to her just this short time for the podcast, I realized she would be a huge asset to have in your corner as a nutrition counselor. There's so much in the episode about fueling properly, body image, female athlete influencers speaking up, and more. So I will just let you listen and hear for yourself what it's all about. I'm sure I'll have plenty to say next week in the newsletter, so be sure to sign up for that at hearhersports.com. Also, be sure to listen to last week's episode with squash pro Amanda Sobey, who, among other things, shares her experience recovering from bulimia. Today's episode with Nancy Clark is a perfect episode to share with others, so please do so. I'm excited for all of you to hear the conversation with Nancy, so let's start. Sports nutritionist Nancy Clark is a certified specialist in sports dietetics. She counsels both competitive athletes and casual exercisers in her successful private practice in the Boston area. Her extensive experience has helped thousands of active clients win with good nutrition. Her nutrition advice and photo have even graced the back of a Wheaties box. She has been team nutritionist for the Boston Red Sox, and her best-selling Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook has sold over 800,000 copies and is now available in its sixth edition. Nancy also writes a monthly nutrition column called The Athlete's Kitchen, which appears regularly in over 100 sports and fitness publications and websites. Nancy is a sought-after nutrition counselor for athletes who struggle with food and weight issues, as well as a nutrition educator and speaker popular with dietitians, trainers, coaches, and other health professionals who want to learn how to effectively teach winning sports nutrition messages. I'm so excited to welcome Nancy Clark. Chocolate is good. There's actually, there's a performance chocolate called Flava Naturals. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No. But uh, flavanols are sort of like beets in that they um, relax the blood vessels and that enhances blood flow. So there's this guy that has, um, he's making high flavanol cocoa powder, like for smoothies and, and chocolate bars. Nice. Yeah. 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 I'm all in. So. <laughs> <laughs> Most people are. Right. Well, I'm going to say hello. Hello, Nancy. Uh, you know, I've always loved talking about nutrition, so this is going to be really fun to talk to you. And um, yeah, thanks for making time. Appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, nutrition for athletes and women athletes in particular, you know, it's just such a huge topic. You know, is there anything right now that is of particular interest to you or that you've been thinking a lot about or have been researching? Yeah, there's a lot that's coming out right now on long-term effects of low energy availability or amenorrhea, underfueling, whatever you want to call it, not only in women, but also in, in, in male athletes. And, um, I've just sort of been researching. I'm going to be giving a talk on weight and health. Is lighter better? 
you know, is the thinnest athlete the best athlete? With the power to weight ratio, how important is it? You know, all these things that athletes get tuned into regarding weight and being a better athlete, you know, stronger, faster, lighter, swifter, da, da, da. Well, that's exactly what I've been thinking about, too. So how appropriate. (laughs) Great minds. Yes. So is lighter, faster, better? (laughs) You know, to a certain extent, there's a tipping point. Uh, You know, I, I think we've all heard stories, you know, about, say, runners that lose weight and they set their PRs and, and they'll just say, oh, but my best running weight, I set my PR when I was, you know, 110 pounds, but it's really hard to stay there. And they jump right back up to 120 pounds. Then they try to lose weight again to get back down to their, their best running weight. And it just gets increasingly harder and harder because 110 is just an, an unnatural place for them to be. You know, let's just use that as an example. So the cost of being your desired racing weight is under eating. And if you're under fueled, how can you perform at your best? So an athlete can be underfed for a season, you know, maybe two, but then they get a stress fracture or then they get tendinitis or they get a torn ligament and the injuries start happening. And as one person said, you know, she was just this race car, just racing along in her light and lean body. And then um, a wheel fell off. And then another one. And another one. And another one. And then the engine dropped out. And, you know, (laughs) there went her running career. Sure. And all this time she was trying to maintain a weight that was just way below her genetic blueprint. And that involved, you know, cutting out carbs, involved, you know, protein that can't be used for protein to build and repair muscles because it has to be used for gas in the car. And the less you eat, the fewer vitamins and minerals you consume. So when you deny yourself of food, you're just denying yourself of valuable nutrients and it, it just adds up over time. And so people end up with, with injuries and there's just a study that came out looking at, you know, women that had been amenorrheic and then just following them and founding those that had been amenorrheic just ended up with a lot more injuries than those that were regularly menstruating. And more of them dropped out of sport because they, you know, were injured, more disordered eating, more eating disorders among that group. And it's so much of it is in the name of being lighter because then you'll be a better athlete. It's like, no, you know, the best fueled athlete who's genetically gifted and has a really strong mind will be the best athlete. But explain that what I call the cruelty of those first few months or years or seasons or whatever you want to call it of being light and being a lean machine. Yeah, well, the body's used to being trained at a heavier weight. So if you weigh 120 and you've been training at that weight for a year or two, and then you decide to whittle it away, I mean, your, your body is used to lugging around those extra pounds, but then the cost of maintaining the lighter weight is, is just, you need to um, reduce your, your, your food intake and that reduces your nutrient intake. So People have a hard time wrapping their brain around that. But uh, that's when I set my PR. It must be because I was lighter. And it's no, there was just sort of like your body was used to being, was used to having trained at that heavier weight. But that doesn't mean that that's sustainable. Right. I mean, that's the problem is that it's not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. And, And people... You know, they talk about the power to weight ratio. You know, cyclists are always into the power to weight ratio. And they think, oh, I'll just lose weight to improve that power to weight ratio. And and like, just lose weight as if losing weight is easy. I mean, how many people do you know that have been trying to lose the same five pounds for the past, you know, 15, 20 years? (laughs) Um, So, oh, I'll just lose weight. Yeah. No, it's much easier to gain power than it is to lose weight. So when I'm working with my clients, I really focus in on, you know, resistance exercise and getting stronger and fueling their workouts. And it's, it's a 
It's a mental shift to go from food is fattening to food is fuel. And people that have spent years trying to stay away from food and they, they don't eat before they work out and they don't want to refuel afterwards because, I mean, why should they eat after they exercise? Because they, I mean, they've already gotten through the workout. They don't need more calories. <laughs> and, and so there, there's a lot of chatter in the brain that gets them into troubles. But yeah, I, I teach my clients how to surround their workout with food and that they need to fuel their muscles And if they don't do that, you know, how will they be able to train at their best? And then how will they be able to compete at their best? I want to ask very specifically how you shift that mindset. But if you want to start sort of before that with another question of like, how do you work with clients? Like a client comes to you and says, I don't know, I need to lose weight or whatever. What happens next? Okay. Um... Well, I'll give an example of a client that came to me just last week, and he's a um, 55-year-old man who bike races, and his PR was when he was like 20 pounds lighter, so he was about 200 pounds. He wanted to be at least 180, if not 170, because that's where he felt the best, you know, performed the best, you know, for that one season. And he was just finding it harder and harder to lose the weight. So I listened to what he was saying, and clearly he was under eating, except for when he would binge. You know, a lot of people diet at breakfast and diet at lunch, and then at nighttime they kind of like blow it at night. And then he'd get up the next morning, diet breakfast, diet lunch, blow it at night. So there's either that pattern or there's the, you know, good on Monday, good on Tuesday, kind of good Wednesday, not so good Thursday, and Friday, Saturday, Sunday in terms of eating. But but this guy was was clearly under eating and he wasn't losing weight. He was totally frustrated. And so I sort of said, you know, if I were to ask your wife if you needed to lose weight, what would she say? No, you should say no. If I were to ask your mom if you needed to lose weight, what would she say? No. If I were to ask your other cycling buddies if you needed to lose weight, what would they say? No. And, and, and so I gathered up information <laughs> how other people perceive his body, right. but he, his eyes were warped. I mean, he just had his brain wrapped around this power to weight ratio. And I had my best race when I was 170. And mm-hmm. now every winter I gain weight. And then in the summer I struggle to lose it. And by September I'm down at my fighting weight again. And then I take my foot off the pedal and thump gain the weight again. And I said, that's maybe because that's where your body, you know, you are born with a genetic blueprint. And I, I'd asked him, how does he look compared to others in his genetic family of, of, of his blood relatives? He says, oh, I'm, I'm leaner than they are. Yeah. And so here you are at 200 leaner than they are, and you want to get down to 180, 170. And uh, it's like, no wonder everyone was saying he didn't need to lose weight. So I, I, I try to get people to understand that weight is not quite as malleable as people think it is. Um, you know, sometimes it would be a lot easier if somebody just grew a couple of inches and sort of stretched out their body fat instead of trying to lose the body fat. But they know that's such a ridiculous thought. Just go grow a few inches. And it's like, you know, well, just go lose five pounds. That that can be equally as ridiculous for for some people that just don't have that excess fat to lose. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'll I'll ask my clients, they come in and I listen to what their goals are from the session, ask them what, you know, a typical day is in terms of eating and exercise, do a more thorough intake, and then try to figure out uh, what do they need to learn? What do I have to teach them? And most of them have no idea how many calories they deserve to eat. You know, I asked this guy, like, how many, how many calories, do you know how many calories you eat in a day? And of course he was tracking this all. He said, yeah, I try to eat around 2,000. I said, do you have any idea how many calories you, if you were the average person doing your level of exercise, how many calories you would deserve to eat? He had no idea. His body, you know, if he was the average person, 
would easily require 2,800, 3,000 or more calories a day, depending on how much you know training he was doing that particular day. So he was eating far less than his body wanted. And no wonder he would get ravenously hungry and you know, get into the peanut butter at night or get into the almonds, (laughs) get into the ice cream if it happened to be there. Oh, we don't keep ice cream in the house, but every so often my wife brings it in and boom, you know, he devours the whole pint. You know, so he was definitely living in food jail and, and also in exercise jail, just doing a lot of punishing workouts in the name of training. But, you know, athletes take rest days and have some hard days and some easier days. And compulsive exercisers that are just burning off calories tend to beat themselves up every day in order to be able to deserve to eat. And it's like, no, we got to work on that mindset. You know, food is fuel. You're a human. Humans eat. You know, dogs eat, birds eat. Um, You're supposed to eat. And you're supposed to, you know, be as nice to your body as you are to your car. You have a car, you put gas in it, it goes. You have a body, you put food in it, it goes so much better. And plus, you're in a better mood. You can enjoy your exercise a lot better. So it's it's a whole conversation working with these people. What was his reaction? He was actually, he was very relieved. He was very happy with what I said, which is not the norm. But I, I said, are you willing to experiment this summer with racing at the weight you're currently at. And he was willing to do that. So I will, you know, I just met with him last week, so I haven't had any follow-up with him. But it'll be interesting to see how much he's able to let go of trying to lose weight and how well is he able to focus on being strong and powerful and well-fueled as opposed to, you know, training lighter which means on empty <laughs> right. most of the time. Yeah. What are the, sort of the things that we're doing wrong that you're seeing most often? Like, is it simply not eating enough or are there other components of that that, you know, like we need to be more careful of? Well, there was a study that looked at carbohydrates and body fat and elite soccer players and they, they interview the soccer players and the coaches, and if the players were under 16, they interviewed the parents. And the, the bottom line was the, the players knew that carbohydrates were important, but they still didn't eat them. The, the, the dinner would just be chicken and broccoli, not chicken and rice and broccoli or chicken and sweet potato and broccoli. It'd just be chicken and broccoli because we know that those carbs, those starchy carbs, we know that they're fattening, (laughs) Uh, which is not true, which is not true. But, you know, the interviews with these, you know, top level soccer players show that they didn't eat carbs, even though they intellectually knew that they were important. The reason was probably because they saw them as being fattening. There's this message that, you know, pervades sports that lighter is faster, lighter is better. And a lot of them, if they had lost their period, were like, oh, phew, glad I don't have to worry about that, especially because we have to wear these white shorts. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so there's there's just a... Uh, you know, people are just hardwired that carbs are bad, <laughs> that they're a waste of calories, that they're fattening, that they cause diabetes. I mean, there's all this negative stuff about them. So I try not to use the word carbohydrate, but I like grains and fruits and vegetables and try to use those as the, the way to fuel your muscles. And again, have people experiment. So if you've been eating a diet that's low in grains and you start having some brown rice or farro or quinoa or potato or pasta for dinner, like how do you perform the next day? And the answer is, wow, did I feel better? Oh, my muscles weren't as sore. So it, it, um, it's a matter of inviting athletes to be curious 
and to experiment and see what they learn. Something that struck me with the soccer players that you mentioned who are not eating carbohydrates and also the man that you mentioned that came to you last week who is, you know, so obsessed with getting his weight down. And also recently I was at a diner overhearing some people that women that were losing weight. And one of them mentioned how much soda she drank and she hadn't realized how bad soda was. Mm -hmm. And I'm just struck by, you know, like here we are in 2023 and those all seem like things that we should know, like that carbohydrates fuel you and soda's bad for you. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to hear that. Social media is very powerful. <laughs> I mean, in the diet message, I mean, Weight Watchers started in, what, 1960 or so? Mm-hmm. I mean, these messages have been around for ages. I mean, one of my most popular blogs is, I can have toast for breakfast and a sandwich for lunch. And it's like, yeah, you can have toast for breakfast and a sandwich for lunch, believe it or not. And our society is just so trendy with anti-starchy foods. And one of the reasons is when people eat carbs, for each one ounce of carbohydrate that gets stored in their depleted muscles as glycogen, they store about three ounces of water. So if you have been training on a very low-carb diet, and then you switch over to have pasta the night before a race or something, if you weigh yourself pre-race, you go, oh my God, I had spaghetti last night and I gained two pounds. I can't even eat pasta without getting fat. You know, it's like, my body's different from everybody else's. And it's like, no, 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 no. If you gain two pounds after having a nice pasta dinner, that means that you carbo-loaded. And you need to know that for each one ounce of carbohydrate that you store in your muscles, you will store three ounces of water and the scale will go up, but it's good weight. It will come back to you during the event. It will help to prevent you from getting dehydrated as quickly. And and so if people understand how there's a lot of water weight swings with high carbs, low carb diets, that makes them a little bit more willing to experiment but the, the focus has to be on how do you feel when you include more bread or oatmeal or brown rice, grains, fruits, veggies in your diet. And inevitably the answer is, oh, I feel peppier, perkier. I had a better workout. You know, I could lift harder. I could go for longer. I was in a better mood. I was warmer. I felt happier, uh, less grumpy. And, and those are the benefits that we really need to focus on. It's, it's about quality of life. It's about quality of life. It's not about a number on the scale. It's not about winning or losing. It's about quality of life. Today's guest, Nancy Clark, wrote the terrific book on sports nutrition called Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook. Order your copy on our bookshop page. While you are there looking at Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook, take a look at the other books recommended or written by my guests. Some super fun stuff is there. And every time you order books through the Hear Her Sports page, we get a small percentage of the purchase and you support local bookstores. Win-win. So check it out at hearhersports.com books. Hi, my name is Andy Billman, and this is the Believe in the Land podcast, a weekly look back at the week that was in Cleveland sports. The highs. Oh, Guardians clap, Guardians clap. The lows. I've been asked on this channel all the time, when are you going to panic? Panic button's been hit. And everything in between. I directed a film that came out in 2016 called Believe Land. And we love our sports here in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you, God! Check in for weekly podcast and so much more. What the hell was that tonight? All in, all day, every day. Go Cleveland, believe in the land.
And now let's get back to sports nutritionist Nancy Clark. How do you have your clients keep track of stuff, meaning what they're eating, what kind of exercise training they're doing? Are they keeping track of their weight or their size or like what what's going on with that? I don't have them track anything. The the body is the best calorie counter. And if you're hungry, you should eat. The body talks to you. If you've done too much exercise and you're tired, your body wants rest. So most of my clients, they come to me tracking calories and exercise and stuff. And, you know, I don't even look at it. I mean, I might ask them how many calories that they normally eat in a day, just as compared to what they deserve to eat. But what I do is I estimate how many calories they they actually require and then divide that into four food buckets. So I see eating as a timeline. And every four hours, you get a food bucket. So on my schedule, generally, it's, you know, breakfast around 7-ish, lunch around 11-ish, second lunch at 3-ish, dinner at 6 or 7-ish. So the trick is you, you want to be eating every four hours. And if you work out in the morning, maybe have part of your breakfast before you work out and part of it afterwards. And if you work out in the morning, you're hungry for an earlier lunch. And, you know, why just have a snack to hold you over to noon when you're hungry now? <laughs> and it's like, you're going to eat the calories eventually. Why don't you eat them when you're hungry? And so you have an early lunch and then you have a later lunch. And the purpose of the later lunch is to ruin your appetite so you're not ravenous at dinner time. And then if you want to, you know, cut back on calories, that's where you can have a lighter dinner. All the snacks that you ate after dinner, you're now eating those calories in the form of a second lunch in the afternoon. So you have a timeline, you've got a food bucket every four hours, and in each bucket, you need to have at least three, if not four different kinds of foods. So you need some sort of grain to fuel your muscles, some sort of protein to build and repair your muscles, some sort of colorful fruit or vegetable for vitamins and minerals, and some sort of dairy or calcium rich food for your bones. So people can track their food just by being able to count to three, if not four different (laughs) kinds of foods. But if I've estimated their their calorie needs and say if they need 2,400 calories, you just divide that into four. So 600 calories, four times a day. And so they, they eat their bucket and they make sure they've got not just oatmeal for breakfast, but oatmeal with milk and a banana and peanut butter and that they ding, ding, ding off their calories, boom, done, on to the next meal. And the breakfast should last them till lunchtime. And if it lasts four hours, it means that they ate the right amount of breakfast. If they're hungry an hour later after breakfast, it means that they just didn't have enough breakfast. So that's sort of how I structure teaching my clients how to eat and how to eat appropriately. You know, if they exercise at the end of the day, then what they eat at breakfast, lunch, and second lunch fuels them up for their five o'clock workout. And then they come back and they won't be ravenous and they'll be, have the energy to do something called cook dinner, like dinner with vegetables in it, as opposed to, you know, picking up a burger or something. I want to go back to this power to weight ratio. Mm-hmm. And Like, do you think that it's, I I don't really know how to ask this question, but I mean, is it a reality? I guess my confusion is, okay, let's say that we agree that there is something to be known about the power to rate ratio. If, for example, Mm -hmm. you're a cyclist and you're going up hills, it's easier if you're carrying fewer pounds. Mm -hmm. However, there's a limit to how much weight you can lose. Mm -hmm. So let's say you are a cyclist. How do you approach knowing both of those things? It's, it's a tough one. And, and it's an experiment. You know, clearly, if you're lugging around 10 extra pounds of flab, that is going to slow you down. I mean, you just know you pick up a grocery bag and then you try to walk this grocery bag up the stairs. You, you know that it slows you down. So we're not talking the obvious weight loss. I mean, there, there is truth in that. But we're talking about those final few pounds that there's such a high cost to get rid of. 
And if, if you can lose weight just by eating well and exercising and the weight sort of comes off at not a very high cost, then that's one scenario. But if you just are totally frustrated that, you know, why are I pencil thin by now? You know, that's another scenario. Each person is an individual conversation. You know, each person has their own apple tree. You know, the apples don't fall too far from the tree. So you always have to look at your apple tree, your genetics. And also recognize that there are many athletes that live in very strong, muscular, powerful bodies that are amazingly good. And even among football, where everybody wants to be bigger and bigger, there are some players that are, you know, smaller, shorter, leaner, that are amazingly good because they're so much faster than the big hulky guys. So you, you will see size diversity in sport if, if you look for it, but none of that really gets, um, no one pays much attention to that. Well, okay, so let's say a cyclist comes to you and basically they want to climb better. How do you approach that? And, you know, they might have a little bit of extra weight, but, you know, after discussing with them and maybe working with them for a while, so, you know, they've been eating well and they are trying to lose, you know, like those extra few pounds. Is that like, is there, is there, is there a, a place to be where you're fueling properly and as lean, basically as lean as you can be? And how do you get there? Well, there's one way to lose weight, and that's to push yourself away from the dinner table. So it's, it's not magic, but what happens is if you don't have weight to lose, the less you eat, the more your body conserves energy. Right. Yeah. And, and it's also not sustainable, which we started yeah, the top yeah, conversation getting, with. Yeah, you end up getting injured. Right. So it, the alternative is to take better care of your body better self-care and really, you know, acknowledge that maybe you aren't meant to be the champion cyclist. Right. I mean, not everybody can be the fastest runner. Not everyone can be the, the best basketball player. I mean, they're just, you know, my body is, is short. I will never be an excellent basketball player, <laughs> you know? That can be a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, it, it, it is. It is. It's accepting. It's Forgiving your body for not being your dream body, the body that you dream of. So it's forgiving it, it's accepting it, and it's f taking better care of it and fueling it. I mean, the best fueled athlete can perform a lot better than the one who's been restrictive. And I've had many an athlete who discovered that they can perform even better when they're at an appropriate weight for their body and well-fueled than when they were lighter. I mean, you look at the number of runners that have had anorexia mm -hmm. and then they go through recovery and they come back and they're faster than they were before. So, I mean, there's lots of case studies of that. And we just need to get those people to become more vocal and that is happening now. I mean, you look at the Mary Kane story um, you look at Molly Seidel. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of people that are just coming out of the woodwork, sharing their stories of having been too, too focused on lightness and leanness and restrictive and losing their menstrual cycle or men who are losing their libido and going on to realize that when they feel better, they can perform exceptionally well. Yeah, and there was another cyclist last summer that, you know, again, he punished himself to, you know, lose weight, get lighter, restrictive eating. And again, experiment. Let's just, let's focus on fueling more than on weight loss. And he was stronger and more powerful than when he had been, been dieting. It happens. It, yeah, it's so interesting, though. I mean, I often watch bike racing on TV, and I notice so many cyclists who, you know, to me look like maybe they're under eating. So it's a, it's a hard example to follow. Yeah, it, it, it is. 
Precisely. And if you live in a, in a stronger, more muscular, more powerful body, I mean, you, you can feel like you're the one that's wrong. <laughs> but if you've got a bigger engine, yeah. And if you've got a, a V8 engine instead of a V6 engine, you know, you probably can keep up with the rest of the guys. I want to go back to something that you said a little bit ago, which was that, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and everyone is an individual. How, how much do individuals differ? How much do individuals differ physically? Well, differ in their, their fueling needs. I mean, you said you don't really keep track of calories, which is the way that we've normally done it. You know, like if somebody runs an hour, they burn X number of calories, and so they need to, to fuel for that. Yeah. But I'm curious about how people differ in terms of the calories that they use and the calories that they need. Well, when I estimate energy needs, you know, first I'll estimate the resting metabolic rate, which generally, you know, the quick and dirty rule of thumb is 10 times your body weight. And say if you weigh 120 uh, your resting metabolic rate is probably about 1,200 calories. And that's just to lie in bed and breathe and do nothing. Just pump blood, make urine, grow hair. So you've got your resting metabolic rate. Then you have, you know, you, you have energy that you need for your daily coming and going, brushing teeth, you know, going to work, walking the dog, whatever, which could be if you're, you know, moderately active during the day, you know, mom, kids, laundry, gardening, whatever, it, it could be another half of your resting metabolic rate. So if you need 1,200 to exist, half of that is 600 to, you know, get through the day. So that's 1,800 without your purposeful exercise. And then you go and run for six miles. You know, theoretically, you're up to 2,400 calories or so. The larger bodies need more fuel than the smaller bodies. I mean, a, a, a Hummer needs more than a Mini Cooper, <laughs> more gas. Um, but there's something called the fidget factor. And some people come to me and they, they swear, it's like, oh, I have a slow metabolism. You know, I eat like a bird compared to my friends. And I watch them. And it's not that their metabolism is slow, because metabolic rate is really pretty standard. It takes a certain amount of energy to pump blood. It takes a certain amount of energy to make urine. It takes a certain amount of energy to grow fingernails. But what differs is the fidget factor. And some people, leaner people tend to be fidgety and animated. And when they, they can be sitting, but their, you know, their foot is twitching back and forth or they're talking with their hands, they're very animated. Whereas Heavier people just sit, and they barely blink an eye. They barely move a muscle. And, and so my husband is always complaining, oh, my metabolism's so slow. I go, no, honey, it's not your metabolism. You just don't move. I mean, he can sit in a chair all day. It's like, oh, man, I can't do that. You know, I, for me to sit for more than an hour is like, oh, get me out of here. <laughs> so... I probably eat a lot more than he does just because I'm a lot more fidgety than he is. That's so, fascinating. Yeah, it, 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 it really is. So people don't take into account the fidget factor, but that really, a, a good fidgeter burns off an extra 300 to 700 calories. That much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's significant. Wow. I'd love to hear more about how you work with the athletes that come to you and maybe some success you've had or, or what you think are, people are learning or not learning? What they're learning, what I teach athletes to do is I teach them how to eat, how to eat, support their training and their athletic goals. They come confused, you know, are carbs fattening? You know, can, can I be a vegan and still be an athlete? How much protein do I need? Do I need these supplements? Is it a, can I get enough protein if I'm, you know, not eating meat? Is, you know, dairy inflammatory? You know, should I 
eat before I exercise? You know, isn't it better to eat fasted? I mean, there's so much, many questions and so much confusion. Mm -hmm. So I just try to give people the science and again, let them experiment and figure out, you know, so you eat something before you, you do your workout. Did you have a better workout? Were you stronger at the end? Was there a benefit? And when there's a benefit, people will make a change. You know, people don't make a change based on knowledge. They make a change based on benefits. And so if they start including more potato with dinner and they notice that they have a better workout the next morning, it's like, wow, you know, maybe if I do eat some carbs that I will be able to perform better. And, and you know, performing better is a big benefit. How long does change take? I mean, how, how, how quickly are athletes one, one able to... One meal. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take long at all. <laughs> You're not going to lose 10 pounds in a meal. <laughs> well, well not, not, not weight change, but performance yes. change. Really? Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just, once you fuel your muscles and then you, you work out, it's like, hmm, yeah, that worked. Huh. Do you have resistance? Do I mean, once people come to you, are they ready to make these changes or are, do you experience a lot of resistance from them? Oh, there's a lot of resistance and I joke about it. So, you know, I'll, I'll throw at them all this information about how many calories they deserve to eat and you divide them into four food buckets and they're eating 500, 600 calories a meal, four meals a day. You know, I can see their eyes glaze over and then I sort of make a joke that, um, you know, just sort of, Say, you know, I, I think I hear a lot of chatter in your brain about how this lady's crazy. She's telling me to eat more when I came here to lose weight. She's telling me to eat four meals a day. She's telling me to eat before I exercise. It's like, like this is like overwhelming. And, and so I just sort of make a joke out of it and the chatter in their brain and how I'm a crazy lady. But maybe they can experiment. And once I acknowledge their fears they become more willing to experiment. But, it, but it's very important to, you know, acknowledge their fears and their fears are that their body's different from everyone else's. If they eat more breakfast and lunch, they're going to get fat, that this will slow them down, that they'll perform worse. And I say, let's just, are you willing to experiment for three days in a row or even just one day and just see if there's a benefit? And most of them are willing to experiment for, you know, a couple of days. But if you get people that are really, you know, stuck in an eating disorder, it's, you know, an eating disorder is a psychological problem. And the, the issue is in food, it's control, it's perfection, it's um, inflexibility. I mean, it, it's a slightly different conversation than those that, just have um, misled food ideas. But REDS is not always a uh, eating disorder. Correct, correct. Right. There, there are a lot of people that are eating healthy and they just don't realize that they're not eating enough. Right. You just mentioned something that, in a way, that I was trying to get at before, which was, you know, like people thinking that their body is so much different than everybody else's. And that's what I was trying to ask before, is like how different are people or are are these rules that we're talking about, can they be used for everybody? I think there are universal guidelines. I mean, everybody's body has circadian rhythms. And those rhythms, I mean, the, the body's clock is designed to be fed during the daylight hours, during the active part of the day. And that's kind of universal. Um... You know, some people are more fidgety than others. But every baby is born with the ability to regulate their eating. I mean, kids are a wonderful example of how you can eat intuitively. You know, kids, they eat when they're hungry. They stop when they're content. They weigh what they weigh. They never run out of energy. Food's not an issue. Weight's not an issue. They eat when they're hungry. They stop when they're content. They'll have a cookie, eat half of it. Here, mommy, I don't want the rest of the cookie. Mommy stares at it and says, well, last chance to eat a cookie. Better eat this now. 
then I'm back in food jail. <laughs> and then she ends up eating even more cookies. So given that 80% of fourth grade girls have been on a diet, that's when things start getting dysregulated. Because when people diet, they don't eat when they're hungry, and then they don't stop when they're content. And food becomes an issue, weight becomes an issue, energy becomes an issue. And it's, um, it's a whole problem. So I spend time getting people back to eating intuitively, and they discover that their body isn't so different from everybody else's, except that the problem is so many people are eating abnormally. <laughs> so if you, you know, what is a normal eater? You know, maybe we'll call them an intuitive eater. And there aren't a lot of intuitive eaters among the the world of sports. I think it's, I find it anyway, you know, like in normal life, I'm pretty good about eating when I'm hungry and not when I'm not. But, you know, like as soon as stress levels rise, I, I don't know, things go awry. <laughs> well, many times when people are stressed, they don't sleep as well. Right. And we do know that when people are sleep deprived, they tend to eat more and they want more fun foods, comfort foods. And so just trying to get, when you're stressed, trying to get plenty of sleep can really be a helpful part of self-care. But, you know, food has a calming effect. It distracts you. I mean, it's much more fun to eat all the brown M&Ms and then the yellow M&Ms <laughs> and then the green m and I mean, you can spend a lot of time just being distracted by eating M&Ms. And that's more fun to think about than, oh my God, I got to do this, blah, 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 blah. And, and all the stuff that, you know, you really need to be paying attention to, but you'd rather distract yourself. Well, since this is a female athlete podcast, have you noticed anything sort of noteworthy that's different about your female clients versus your male clients? I've noticed that society has been more brutal on female clients in terms of, oh, you women have to be attractive. And even if you're, and that means thin, and even mm -hmm. athletes want to be attractive and thinner. But male athletes are also getting a lot of pressure these days. They need to look very hulky and muscular and, you know, supermanish. So I'd say body image issues, but, you know, it's just generations of women being convinced that, you know, thinner is more attractive, thinner is more acceptable, thinner is more lovable, thinner is more perfect. And it's like, no, there's just less of you. <laughs> is that changing at all? Have you noticed any? Yeah, I, I think oh, that's it is good. changing. I mean, just look at TV ads. I watch, t look at TV ads these days, and rarely do you find a, a super skinny model like person on the advertisements. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're more look more like people. And and what I remind my clients that people like dogs come in different sizes and shapes. What does a dog look like? Well, are you talking about Saint Bernard? or a greyhound, or a labrador, or a golden retriever, or a chihuahua, or a beagle? Like, what does a dog look like? And what does a human look like? Oh, oh, what does a runner look like? Oh, we all know what runners look like. No. You know, runners, like dogs, come in different sizes and shapes. So it's what breed of runner are you? What breed of person are you? You know, some breeds are Polish. Some of them are... Asian, some of them are Norwegian, some of them are Mexican. I mean, different breeds of humans come in different sizes and shapes. And so there's there's not a universal body. And I think that people are realizing that and they're getting to be more proud of their genetics and their heritage. So it, it, it's certainly, there's a, a culture change going on. I mean, even colleges now are putting a lot less time into measuring body fat. But it used to be, oh, that was the thing. Get your body fat measured. And that would it was a real important data point for how well you'll perform. And it turned into a way to make people perform worse because they were so anxious about getting their body fat measured that they'd starve themselves. 
And then performance went downhill and injuries and, you know, skyrocketed. Yeah, I was surprised. I mean, the recent articles, I mean, you mentioned the Mary Kane story and, and mm-hmm. whatnot. It just, you know, like I was surprised to hear about how many coaches subscribe to these sort of restrictive diets and, you know, visions, as you said, of what a runner looks like and should look like. Yeah, because their reputation is wrapped up in it. Mm. And men lose weight, generally lose weight easier than women do. I mean, men are supposed to be the lean and mean hunters in terms of evolution. And so, you know, men add on exercise and they drop pounds like crazy. Women add on exercise, they get hungry and they eat more. (laughs) (laughs) Or so it seems. So men, male coaches, often don't appreciate females' physiology. But even... Yeah, there's just, just there's a big culture change that's coming. There, there are more and more social media influencers who are making a big difference about how women are thinking. I mean, you've got your Mary Kane's, you've got your Lauren Fleshman's, you've got your Tina Muir's. I mean, you have, you know, Ali Ostrander. There, there's a whole bunch of people that have huge social media followings. I mean, I just get jealous when I look at, oh, they've got like 145,000 followers. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, man. <laughs> um, so they're they're coming out of the closet and they're making their voices heard. It's yeah, it's like, great. Don't starve yourself, young ladies. Eat, fuel, be strong and powerful. You know, most most runners don't peak in their teens. They peak in their late 20s and early 30s. Particularly for women, yeah. Yeah, when when puberty, you know, becomes becomes feared because, oh, no, my body's going to change and I'm going to get fat and then I'll get slower. It's like, let your body do what your body's going to do. You know, women have more body fat than men do. That's because we're women and they're just men. And... And be be proud of all that your body does for you. I read somewhere that you said be proud of your thunder thighs, and that, yeah, strong that and powerful. certainly struck a nerve with me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just have to rename them. Oh, my strong and powerful legs! They help me be a great runner when I'm running up those hills or biking up those hills. You know, they're they're your engine. Well, before we go, is there something very particular that you would want people to know about fueling properly that we have not already talked about, I guess? Yeah, I want them to know that if they want a uh, coherent, cohesive summary of all that I've talked about, that I have a sports nutrition guidebook that has sections on just day-to-day eating on the run, tell me what to eat, resolves the confusion, a section on sports nutrition, fueling during refueling, a very strong section on weight, body image, dieting gone awry, how to lose weight and have energy for exercise, and then a lot of quick and easy recipes, you know, for people that aren't phenomenal cooks. So it's called Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook, and it has helped a lot of people. I mean, it's in sixth edition now. It's available on my website, which is nancyclarkrd.com. And I just encourage people that are struggling to get a copy. And you don't have to read the whole thing. You can just read the pieces that are appropriate to you, like, you know, chocolate cravings or snack attacks or, you know, electrolytes or protein powders or whatever. And, And just to get educated from a scientific point of view. And so I take the science and just translate it into this is what you do. And like I say, it's, it's been very well received and it's something that I'm proud of. What I've struck reading that book and also talking to you today is that you make it sound so simple. <laughs> you know, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Eating is not rocket science. And, and what you have to do is just ask yourself, why am I stopping eating? So you're having your breakfast. Are you stopping eating breakfast because you're content? Because the food is gone? Because you think you should? 
And if you're stop eating because you're content, you're eating intuitively. But after your English muffin, if you're stop eating because you think you should, because you ate the whole thing and the food is gone, but I'm still hungry, you're just not listening to your body. So the body can regulate proper intake, believe it or not. The problem is if people get too hungry, things go awry. And so many people get too hungry because they don't eat enough food at meals. And the, the analogy is, you know, if I were to stick your head under water and keep it there too long, when you popped up, could you breathe normally? No. <gasps> Physiological. Okay, so let's just give you coffee for breakfast and let us leave for lunch. You know, when the birthday cake comes around in the afternoon, can you just say, no, thank you? It's like, no, you want to eat the whole thing because you think you're addicted to sugar. I think you're just way too hungry. And when people get too hungry, they will not only eat, but they will crave carbs and sweets and they will overeat. And that is physiological. It's not weak willpower. Wow, that's a great, that, that's great. That sort of goes to what I asked you about how fast can change happen. I mean, that person who has been underwater having to make a decision, mm -hmm. you know, if they eat one good breakfast, are they able to make good decisions for the rest of the day food-wise? <laughs> they sure are. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. Huh. Yeah. And, and if people are addicted to, I had a client who was addicted to pizza. I mean, he couldn't just have one or two pieces of pizza, had to eat like everything, the whole thing. And I said, your homework assignment is to eat pizza at every single meal for the next week. And he came back a week later and he said, I did it. <laughs> but he said, I am so sick of pizza. And, and to this day, he can now just eat a piece or two of pizza normally. It took the power away from it. So when the food has power over you, it means you like it. You should eat it more often and not try to stay away from it because it's the denial deprivation that just leads to overeating, binge eating, last chance eating, breaking out of food jail, whatever you want to call it. I feel like I should meditate before I start working with you or something. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's been, it's been really great talking Your to you. pleasure. Regular listeners know I love talking anything food and nutrition related, so meeting Nancy Clark and being able to spend time with her was absolutely fantastic. I really appreciated her no-nonsense, science-based approach. Thank you, Heidi, for making the connection. Heidi is Heidi Skolnick, also a sports nutritionist, who was one of my early guests. She is the author of many books, including the recent Whole Body Reset, which a is superb and a terrific resource, and B is available at hearhersports.com slash books. As always, thank you for listening. It's fantastic, and I totally appreciate you taking the time and hope you learned something new. Do tell your friends about this episode about proper fueling for performance. As Nancy mentioned in our conversation, education is important, so send all your pals the link so they can listen as well. Visit hearhersports.com to find Nancy Clark's show notes, which includes links to purchase her book, the female runners she cited as influencers, and an article about white shorts. Hear Her Sports is a proud member of Evergreen Podcasts. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcast.com. A great place to start is, of course, Women's Running Stories and Keeping Track, both other female athlete podcasts, I know that you're going to love. As always, I love hearing from you. Reach me by sending an email to elizabeth at hearhersports.com or connect through social at hearhersports. Until next time, bye-bye. So, nice man, I have to let my dog in. Hang on. Hi, my name is Andy Billman, and this is the Believe in the Land podcast a weekly look back at the week that was in cleveland sports the highs oh guardians clap guardians clap the lows i've been asked on this channel all the time when are you gonna panic panic buttons been hit and everything in between i directed a film that came out in 2016 called believe land 
and we love our sports here in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you, God! Check in for weekly podcasts and so much more. What the hell was that tonight? All in, all day, every day. Go Cleveland, believe in the land.